Hey, everyone. You're listening to It's Been a Minute from NPR. I'm Brittany Luce. This week, we're deconstructing beauty and diet trends. And we're starting with the face. And there's one family in particular that has made their face their brand, the Kardashian Jenners. My first guest, Jessica DeFino, is a beauty reporter and cultural critic, but at one point she actually worked as an editor for the Kardashian Jenner apps, which meant she received a lot of free luxury skincare samples. That eventually backfired on my face, on my skin, and on my soul. The products, the work, the paycheck, which she says was not even enough to afford the gas she needed to get to work, eventually took their toll. And she began to really examine the beauty boxes she once joyfully received. It really started my whole journey with learning, like, how does the skin actually function? And that was a big light bulb moment for me, separating function of the skin from skincare products, separating care from consumerism. In this chat from November 2022, I talk with Jessica about a trend that's been snowballing for the last few years celebrity beauty lines. And she's got all the answers from what these celebs are actually selling to the reasons the face was left behind in the body positive movement. In the world of beauty, skincare seems to really be having this huge moment. Why do you think it's such a big focus of the beauty industry right now? Oh, there are so many reasons why skin is having a big moment. Color cosmetics are sometimes seen as superficial or like a vapid pursuit. Skincare has all of these claims to health and wellness. So it's easier for people to feel like they are taking care of themselves, that this is for their health, their well-being, even their mental health, mm. and not feel like they're funneling time into perpetuating beauty standards, um, even though that is, for the most part, what skincare is as well. <laughs> <laughs> but still, a, a lot of people, a lot of consumers are looking to people to influence their purchasing decisions, especially around skincare, because I feel like we've reached this huge like zenith point where it feels like every celebrity or influencer has a skincare brand. Oh Why gosh. do so many celebrities have skincare brands now? I do think money is the main driver. <laughs> celebrities have always been very involved in the beauty industry, but traditionally they have been more involved in the way of endorsement deals. So they would be the face of an established skincare brand or a fragrance mm. brand or a cosmetics brand. And I think just with the way the world is moving, it doesn't seem as lucrative of, of a position to be the face of somebody else's brand when you could pretty easily be the face of your own brand. So I do think there's an element of control, there's an element of capitalism, and then there's mm. also the element of just fame. So this is the thing. The thing that gets me with celebrity skincare lines is how they're selling a product that did not help them to achieve the like, like the clear, glassy, plump skin that they have now. Yes. Like even thinking specifically about like say Jennifer Lopez, right? Mm -hmm. Like she came out with skincare line a couple of years ago. She has been known to have very clear, beautiful skin for like two decades. It's not like she was using her <laughs> Jennifer Lopez skin <laughs> products like back in 2009. Like she just came up with these. That's not why her face looks like that. It is so true. I mean, celebrities have quote unquote good skin, the cultural uh -huh. ideal of good skin because of strong genetics, expensive facials, injectable fillers, maybe even some light surgery. <laughs> and then <laughs> they're turning around and saying, if you buy these products that I just came up with, even though you've been idolizing me for 20 years, <laughs> you can look like me too. Like what is, what is quote unquote good skin? What does that mean? I personally despise the term good skin. I think good skin is an excellent example of how beauty has been wrapped up in morality. Mm. Beauty functions in society as an ethical ideal. And we have been fed messages since you know, the minute we pop out of the womb that 
to be a good person is to be a beautiful person. You know, you even look at like Disney princess movies um, and you look at the princess who's good and you look at the villain who's ugly. Like we right. get these messages constantly. I do think that the idea of good skin shifts over time as beauty standards and beauty trends do. Mm-hmm. Currently, I think the ideal of good skin is very smooth, extremely yes. shiny, wet looking. There is no allowance for changes in tone or texture. It's very flat, glass-like. It reflects the state of our largely virtual digital lives. You know, we're expecting our faces to look like a screen. Hmm. And it's so interesting because when you look back on like the history of beauty and the history of beauty standards, this isn't really a new phenomenon. So for instance, like when movies first came out, and we could see actresses and on the screen, the lighting wasn't that great. The camera quality wasn't that great. And it lent this sort of blurred, ethereal look to actors and actresses. And all of a sudden, people were like, this is what somebody famous and worthy looks like. I want to look like that too. Every advancement in screens, in cinema, in digital has had that moment And we are trying to adapt our real life human faces to a virtual hyper real standard of beauty. So to talk about Kim Kardashian for a second, who just put out her own skincare line, you wrote about an interview of hers where she said that if she had to eat poop every day in order to stop aging, she would. What do you think the marketing around her product says about where we are as a society? Because she gave that quote to the New York Times. Someone like her knows what she's saying if she's talking to the New York Times. Exactly. She gave that quote to the New York Times, and then she doubled down on it in an interview for Allure magazine um, a couple of weeks later. So she said it twice. She's been very clear that she would eat poop (laughs) if it would make her look younger. (laughs) I think it says a lot about the state of modern beauty marketing and modern skincare marketing because in that very same New York Times interview, the Times noted that Kim Kardashian for her skincare line is opting not to use the term anti-aging to market any of her products. They don't want to use this negative connotation of anti-aging. However, when you come out in that same article and say that you would eat excrement to look younger, you're perpetuating anti-aging ideology. And I think this is a really important thing to note because in the beauty industry at large, we are seeing sort of a backlash to negative sounding terms like anti-aging, but the underlying ideology hasn't changed. Like our society and our beauty industry in particular is more youth obsessed than ever It's just that these messages are more being told in the underlying marketing stories, in the models being used, in the products being pushed, in the injectables being normalized. Like we are living in a youth glorifying culture, even if we are like, oh, I'm not going to say anti-aging. To like bear down on this a little bit more, why do we not want to use the term anti-aging and yet still don't want to age? Like what's beneath that? Anti-aging at its core is ageism, plain and simple. It is internalized ageism. And of course, the underlying ideology hasn't changed because we live in a deeply ageist society. You know, we value members of society uh, largely for their productivity. Your productivity and your value to the economy wanes the older you get. We don't have equity for the elderly. We don't have sufficient medical care for the elderly. We don't have a lot of resources in place that would make aging seem like an appealing proposition. Mm. (laughs) We also live in a very surface level society. So if we can take away some of our age anxiety by temporarily erasing our wrinkles with a shot of Botox, Mm. um, we're going to go for that because we have been (laughs) trained to want a quick and easy sweep it under the rug fix for what is actually a societal problem. So so I just have never been a big makeup person. It's it's just never been a, a super huge thing for me. Like day to day, I usually don't wear any, but I notice that increasingly in professional situations, if I feel like I'm getting dressed and I see my face and I don't have it, it's almost like my brain tells me that I look incomplete in a certain way. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is a message that we have been fed by beauty culture for pretty much our whole lives. I mean, to contextualize it, I like to frame beauty culture as diet culture's face-focused fraternal twin (laughs) because I think people are really familiar with diet culture and how insidious it is and the things that it does to our minds and our self-perception. It's what diet culture does but for your face. (laughs) So like, (laughs) it's totally understandable that you would feel that way. I mean, I feel that way. I put on concealer and, and a brow gel for this interview because I was like, maybe I'll be on camera. (laughs) And, you know, this is the stuff that I've been deconstructing for, you know, the better part of a decade now, but it still exists within me because I still exist within society (laughs) that tells me I need to look professional and put together. What I always say when, when this comes up is like, we have to be gentle with ourselves. We have to understand that beauty culture is insidious and it does affect us psychologically and it does do a lot of damage and it's okay to participate in some of these beauty norms because they do still Mm -hmm. affect us on a professional level. Mm -hmm. I think the most important thing is just to be aware of it, to divest when you can, when it feels safe, when it feels like it isn't a threat to your professional Mm -hmm. and financial well-being and to just keep talking about it because I think right now, Um, Beauty especially gets praised as um, self-expression and self-care and empowerment. And of course, beauty can be those things. Like there is a powerful case for makeup as self-expression and as art. And I love using makeup in that way. But just because these things can be true doesn't mean that they are always true. Mm. And it doesn't mean that they're the primary ways that beauty is being used. Like primarily Physical beauty today is being used as a tool of conformity, complacency, control, and consumerism. Hmm. You brought up um, diet culture. I can't think about diet culture without also thinking about body positivity. Mm. Like the connection between body positivity and sort of beauty culture and, and where they kind of will intersect or overlap or not makes me think about another influencer who was recently marketing skincare, Katie Storino. Mm. Uh, So for people who are not familiar, she's a businesswoman known as a body positive model, very famous on Instagram. And yet not long ago, she was marketing Botox on her Instagram page in a post that has since been deleted. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, her whole message is body positivity. And yet she was, you know, pushing Botox. And I, I know influencers, they make money in lots of different kinds of ways and sell lots of different kinds of ads. But that felt dissonant. Like it it almost feels like skincare is divorced from the body positive movement. Yes. Yes. I 100% agree. There is a huge disconnect there. The body positivity has has rarely extended above the neck in popular culture, (laughs) uh, which is always concerning to me. The standard of beauty is a set of parameters. Like you, Mm. there's some room for, for change. I think people can understand the idea of maybe having a fat body, but a pretty face. Like those have always sort of been like a consolation prize. Like, well, maybe I'm fat, but I have such a pretty face. Mm -hmm. And so these parameters still exist and the body positivity movement did not address those parameters at all. So we see a lot of body acceptance influencers like Katie Storino preaching about accepting your body and loving your body and funneling the, the, brain space that they have freed up and worrying about their body image to their face. Mm -hmm. And something that I always like to say is skincare culture is just dewy diet culture. Like, and you can make (laughs) these really easy swaps to see if a piece of content feels right to you. So for instance, I think in Katie Storino's Botox post, she was talking about erasing her frown lines. Right. But if you swapped the word frown lines for stretch marks, would that content, would that anti-aging, anti-wrinkle content still feel good if it was telling mm. you you had to get rid of your stretch marks? Like there's really no difference between these things. It's just that we have separated body from face and body from skin. And I really just hope that it's time that we bring all of this together and can see how we have been like collectively bamboozled by diet culture and beauty culture and skincare culture. And they all stem from the same forces. Yeah. It almost feels like there's this like algebraic equation, like body Mm -hmm. size, race, gender presentation, skin, age. You can have, you know, a certain type of features or a certain skin tone, but your hair has to have 
a certain kink to it or curl to it. It has to be absolutely straight. It feels like, like there's a conventional beauty standard where you have to constantly be accounting for quote unquote perceived flaws Mm -hmm. that fall outside of these narrow norms. And like, you can't sort of be almost quote unquote flawed Mm -hmm. in more than two or three aspects. Otherwise you fall outside, you fall too far outside of like conventional Yes. Beauty norms. And I don't I don't think I'm like imagining this. <laughs> no, no, you're not at all. That is exactly how it works. I used to love watching America's Next Top Model. I mean, didn't we all back uh, then? <laughs> yes. And there was one season, I don't know if this was like a consistent thing that Tyra Banks said, but there was one season in particular where I remember she talked about this idea of being flossom. And she encouraged the models <laughs> yes. to pick out their one flaw and really play it up. So like her flossom thing was her big forehead. I remember. I mean, it has stuck with me for probably 20 years now. You're only allowed to have one flaw. And yeah. so whenever that concept of parameters comes up, I think of the scam of being flossom. <laughs> Okay, so I've been reading your work for some time. The thing I think about, though, with regard to beauty, and I've been thinking about this a lot, is like divesting from, like coming from where I'm coming from as a Black woman, it's hard for me to imagine divesting from something that I never really felt fully welcomed into in the first place, from having Mm -hmm. like, and I'm on the lighter side and I still can't Mm -hmm. like buy makeup at many places, you know? And you said something earlier about like, divesting when it feels safe. But I think for a lot Mm. of people with regard to beauty, some people literally are not safe. Yes. Divesting from beauty even a little bit. I think that's such a valid point. Like beauty culture is part of reinforcing racism and colorism. And you can see this in the products that are on offer. For example, Mm -hmm. you can look at like any foundation range of most beauty brands pre-Fenty and you would see, you know, 20 shades for lighter skinned women and maybe three shades for dark skinned women to choose from. Yeah, This is not like a flaw in the beauty system. It's a design of the beauty system. And it's tempting to champion inclusion as the answer to all of it. Mm. And like to a certain extent it is like we should have products available for every person. And I think it's really important to sort of separate these two tracks to equality. Like there is one track where it's all about inclusion and it's all about making everybody feel seen. And it's all about having something available for every person. And then there's another track where we abolish beauty standards completely. Like in an ideal world, we should be able to be respected as human beings, no matter what we look like by virtue of being human beings. So like, I hear what you're saying, and I agree with it. Beauty still feels like something that I think we need to buy into. Even you said you put on some concealer and brow gel Mm -hmm. before you came to talk to me today. Why is beauty something that we feel that we need to buy into? Oh, this is such a great question. Beauty is an inherent human longing. Like when I'm critiquing the beauty industry, I am critiquing the industrialized, standardized portions of it. And I never mean to diminish the power and the importance of beauty in our lives. Like I think of beauty as being up there with like freedom, truth, and love. These are inherent human longings. These are spirit things. The human spirit craves and needs beauty. And we appreciate this all over in other ways. You know, we can appreciate the beauty of nature. We can appreciate the beauty of like a a piece of artwork. We need that kind of beauty in our lives. And part of what makes the beauty industry so powerful is that it co-ops this instinctual need, this instinctual craving for this like free, beautiful, energetic, (laughs) three-dimensional version of beauty. And it flattens it into one dimension. And it says, no, beauty is only physical and beauty can only be achieved through these products and these procedures um, with this money. And it, and it really sort of like bamboozles us into believing, okay, that's the beauty that my spirit is craving. <laughs> and that's also why it's so unfulfilling. Mm. We keep buying and we keep trying things and we keep applying things and we keep trying to make ourselves look different because that inherent human longing for beauty is not satisfied by the physical, standardized, industrialized stuff. And I mean, I don't have an answer for it. 
I don't know how we, we get all of us to like connect with that kind of beauty rather than physical appearance. But that's sort of what keeps me going. That's what keeps me interested. I think beauty is so important to our like well being on a soul level. And it just upsets me so much that we've been fed this one dimensional, flat, unfulfilling definition of what beauty is. Thanks again to beauty reporter Jessica DeFino. You can find her work on her Substack newsletter, The Unpublishable. Coming up, it's time to have the talk. Not that talk, but the fat talk. Author, writer, and host Virginia Soul Smith joins the show to chat about why we need to talk to our kids about fatness. From the Rough Translation podcast, when falling in love means risking your life, this group in India promises to protect lovers. The love commandos. The love commandos. I was like, wow, this is so cool. But are they heroes or villains? Listen to Love Commandos on NPR's Embedded, wherever you get your podcasts. Virginia Soul Smith says we all need to have the talk, but not the one you may be familiar with. She's talking about the fat talk. Those of us who survived the 90s and the 2000s, we know what diet culture did to us as teenagers. Virginia Soul Smith is an author, writer, and host of the Burnt Toast newsletter and podcast. And her work focuses on rethinking how we feed our families and our ideas about fatness. We don't want to repeat those cycles, but we're not really sure what else to do because we haven't reckoned with the underlying issue, which is anti-fat bias. Virginia has noticed an emerging problem from parents. They want their children to have healthy relationships to food and their bodies, but they don't want their kids to get fat. It's a huge anxiety, but she says this dilemma is flawed. And so unless we divest from that, we're always putting these guardrails around who gets to have a good relationship with food and with their bodies. We get into some of the lessons she learned while writing her latest book, Fat Talk. With lots of research backing her up, she tells us why it's completely okay for children to be fat. And even if you don't have kids, there's plenty in this conversation for you. All right, here's my chat from early June with Virginia. Virginia, welcome to It's Been a Minute. Thank you. I am thrilled to be here. A lot of your work is built on the thesis that it is okay and normal for children to be fat. Yes. And this is not a small thing. Like, it's a really tough idea for a lot of people to grasp because fat phobia is so ingrained in our society. Why is it important for people, especially caregivers, to internalize that idea that it is okay and normal for children to be fat? For a couple of reasons. I mean, number one, because it's true, because human diversity is a great thing. Bodies have always come in different shapes and sizes. And the relationship between weight and health is not as one-to-one as we've been led to believe it is. So it is very possible for a kid to be healthy and growing well and just in a bigger body, in a fat body, and that is great. Mm -hmm. And We need to stop pathologizing that because when we pathologize that, kids internalize the idea that their body is a problem to be solved. Hmm. And so the rest of the world is going to give your fat kid this message, right? Like that is the reality for fat kids in the world. We think we want to protect our kids from that, right? We want to keep them safe. But too often our decision is, well, I'll keep them safe if I can prevent them from being fat or make them less fat now, if I can control their body size, I will keep them safe from all of this. And that is a losing proposition. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, you also break down in your book so much research that shows that it's not inherently unhealthy to be fat. As you say, a high body weight is not a disease. Can you break down some of the studies and research that show that to be the case? Sure. And I do want to say just off the top before we get into all that is... Mm -hmm. There are folks in bigger bodies who are unhealthy, and we also need to stop making health a criteria for body acceptance. Like, you can be unhealthy and you are still allowed to feel safe in your body. You should still have Mm. access to the world in the same way that anyone, any, quote, healthy person does. So there's a way in which health has become a matter of privilege in our country, and I think that's very much tied into all of what we're talking about here. But yes, it is also true that we do not have 
data demonstrating a causal relationship between body size and poor health outcomes. We have a lot of what's called weight-linked conditions, things like heart disease, diabetes, high cholesterol. It's a premise we're not questioning that the more you weigh, the more likely you are to get these diseases. But what the research really shows is a correlation between these two things. It doesn't show that the high body weight itself causes those diseases. Right. So what we really need to do is dig into, like, what else is going on? Maybe there's some underlying issues that is both causing folks to be in bigger bodies and increasing rates of diseases. There may be a link here, but that doesn't mean that the weight causes the health problem. Right. As you note, you know, in, in your book, a lot of scientists are careful to state the difference between causation and correlation in so many other types of research having to do with health and bodies. But that's not the case when it comes to studies around weight and dieting. No, it's not because there is so much money to be made in selling weight loss. And I think we can see this with weight loss drugs right now. We can see this in conversations around bariatric surgery. These are incredibly profitable industries. And yet we also know that intentional weight loss has the highest failure rate of almost any medical intervention. So you would not take a medication with an 80% failure rate, but that is the failure rate of intentional dieting to lose weight. We see that folks will lose some weight in the short term, and then within the next two to five years, they will regain it and usually regain it plus. And so the other piece of this weight health conversation is even if it was the weight that caused the health problems, mm -hmm. as opposed to some other underlying issues that we don't totally understand, even if it was the weight causing the health issues, we don't have a safe and effective way for most people to lose weight and keep it off mm. in the long term. That's true. So that's not really a useful path in terms of promoting people's health. And we do know that a risk of future eating disorders is dieting experiences. You talk in the book about how you can't control the reverberations that come from intervening in how your child eats. Like you interviewed children who responded to restrictions by sneaking food mm -hmm. and by binging or on the flip side, reacting to diets or, you know, quote unquote, meal plans by developing an eating disorder. Yeah. And you don't know and you can't tell from your child's body size. I want to be really clear how your child will respond to restriction. I would say the most common response I hear about from readers, from parents is, well, now I'm finding the bag of cookies in their room. Parents mm -hmm. perceive it as overeating and binging and sneaking food. And what it really is, is a response to restriction. And I think anyone who's been around a child understands the more you <laughs> forbid things, the more your child wants them. Right. The other option is some kids will respond to your restriction with more and more restriction. And this isn't necessarily a conscious choice. There's mm -hmm. a thing that happens called energy imbalance, where if a child is not taking in enough energy to support their body throughout the day, mm -hmm. they will then be pushed into this negative energy imbalance where they're not getting enough. And that alone can trigger a restrictive eating disorder in folks who are predisposed to do that. And again, it's really important to say that can happen to kids in all body sizes. And all too often when it happens to fat kids, they are congratulated because they're finally, you know, quote, being good or being healthy. Maybe they're losing weight and that makes everyone really happy. And what you've actually just done is reinforce a deadly eating disorder. I don't think there's a caregiver out there who wants those things for their child. But <laughs> Absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of people will really have trouble with your ideas around how there are no bad foods for kids. Many people out there are going to struggle with that. What would you say to them? I mean, fundamentally, what parents are saying when they say, no, 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 there are bad foods and I shouldn't let my kids have these foods, is they're saying, I don't believe you because I've never experienced freedom around these foods. I don't trust myself around these foods. And so it is both the bias against foods, against processed foods, against whatever is on their list of, quote, bad foods. Mm -hmm. And it's also the anti-fat bias that they may or may not be willing to name. Because when you peel back, but okay, but why are you concerned about their sugar intake? But why are you concerned about their processed food intake? We always get back to, I don't want them to be fat. And so this is a real paradigm shift that I am arguing for where I say we have to let go of that fear. I think sometimes talking about the fundamental shift doesn't work though, because it's so big. It's so big to say, like, you have to stop being afraid of fat. What sometimes seems to land better is to understand that restriction will backfire. Coming up, Virginia on why foods like Cheetos and Oreos 
might have a healthy place in our diets. Stick around. I, I feel like another another reason, though, why it, it might be so hard for the caregivers to make this leap is like the nutrition factor. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of parents, a lot of caregivers worry about nutrition. I feel like it's not table shaking to say that Cheetos are not <laughs> highly nutritious food. <laughs> I don't feel like that's like shaking the table to say that, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> I can still hear listeners saying, well, if my child eats Cheetos or Oreos every day or something like that, or if they have access to these foods that are not necessarily nutritionally dense, this is going to negatively impact their health. What about that thought? So the first thing we have to do is back up and say, when we define what makes a healthy food, How much Mm -hmm. privilege are we using to define that? Because if you're a single mom who's working three jobs and needs to get dinner on the table, the Mm -hmm. McDonald's drive-thru dollar menu is a healthy choice for you, right? You can afford it. You can get food quickly. You can feed your family. That's a win. Mm -hmm. That's a healthy dinner because it's healthier than not being able to feed them. And it's healthier Mm -hmm. than you making yourself miserable trying to cook some from scratch meal that you don't have time or the budget to do. You know, when my older daughter had a pediatric feeding disorder and we were working night and day to help her learn to become an oral leader again, I resisted giving her chocolate milk because I thought it would be unhealthy. This is where I was with it, right? I had a Mm. two-year-old who couldn't drink by mouth and I thought, no, no, I can't be a bad mom and give her chocolate milk. Actually, chocolate milk was the healthiest option for her because it tasted good and it gave her a reason to want to work on her drinking skills as a two-year-old. And guess what? As an almost 10-year-old, she likes chocolate milk fine, but she drinks regular milk very happily. She drinks water very happily. Like it's not <laughs> – she didn't become a chocolate milk fiend because I let her have it as a one-and-a-half-year-old. She It was useful to us at that time. So I think it's really important to say like even the quote unhealthy foods, even Cheetos, like lots of feeding therapists will tell you about the therapeutic value of Cheetos. They're a great learning food for kids who are struggling with all kinds of motor challenges around eating. So – Even the foods we consider super unhealthy often have a place in our lives that I would define as healthy. If they're helping you feed your family, if they're helping a cautious eater feel safe in the cafeteria because they can count on Uncrustables are always on the menu and that's a thing they Mm. eat and they can get lunch that day. A kid eating lunch is always healthier than a kid not eating lunch. Mm. So there's that big picture shift we need to make. We need to really redefine how we think about healthy eating and how much emphasis we put on nutrition. And then in terms of, okay, what do I do with this at home? Let's say budget is not a concern. Let's say you are someone who likes to cook at least, you know, half the week. You like vegetables. You enjoy eating them. You want your child to enjoy eating vegetables. The solution is to have vegetables and not make a fuss over the vegetables being so super great, not make eating them contingent on eating the other foods, and just have Mm. those foods around alongside the foods your kid likes. So when you say like not contingent on eating the other foods, like if you want dessert, if you want ice cream, if you want a cookie. Yeah, you don't earn it. You got to eat your spinach. You don't have to earn it. No. Hmm. Because when we do that, there's a really good study that was done in the early 2000s by a researcher named Leanne Birch, where they told kids, they told half the kids in the group, you have to finish your soup. And they told the other kids, you don't have to finish your soup. You can eat as much soup as you want. Mm -hmm. The kids who didn't have to finish their soup ate more soup and liked it more than the kids who Hmm. were forced to finish their soup. There are many parents who say that they don't want their kids to deal with the same treatment they've dealt with um, or, you know, they've seen other fat people deal with. But that's not the only social reason why caretakers are so concerned with making sure their kids aren't fat. As you noted in your book, there are real consequences parents might face just by having a fat child. What are some of the ways that parents are held responsible for their kids' bodies? Well, the worst case scenario, and we don't talk about it enough, but it is happening, is that a kid's high body weight is often held against parents in custody disputes, whether that's with another parent or caregiver or Mm. in situations where CPS is called in, high body weight and the amount of junk food in the house will be listed among the list of reasons why a parent's losing parental rights. You you shared a specific story about that in your book of Anna Marie Regino. Yes, Anna Marie Regino made headlines in the early 2000s when her parents lost custody of her at the age of three because of her body size. And it really blew up as this national story. I mean, she really became a kind of patient zero for the war on childhood obesity because I think 
there were a lot of people who looked at that situation and said, well, they can't be good parents if their child is this big at three years old. This is so dangerous. Da, 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 da. And there was also a lot of coded racism and classism involved in that. So the way that story played out really showed how much we hold a child's weight against their parents. The fact was these were incredibly loving, caring parents who had been advocating for their daughter's medical care for years, not being taken seriously. And for them to lose custody of her was this huge trauma for the whole family and particularly for the child and really should never have happened. If you want to talk about kids' health, keeping families intact is a good way to promote their health, you know? Right, right. It also feels like, I mean, the pressure for parents to have thin children is like the pressure for parents to have children who are good students. Exactly. You talk a bit about how anti-fat bias hurts fat children for many reasons um, in your book, but you also point out that it harms thin children as well who internalize those lessons about what it means to be fat. I was a thin child and it's a specific experience. Yes. Can you explain a bit more about how anti-fatness hurts thin children as well, you know, possibly even sharing your own experiences. Yeah, this is my story. I was a thin kid until I went to college. You know, I never received negative messages about my body size. The fact that I was really unathletic, like really unathletic, I can't underscore that enough, was just sort of like a joke. People were like, oh, it's so funny. She just loves to read more than, you know, like don't throw a ball at her. She won't catch it. You know, no one said, like, but we need you to be more active because you need to lose weight. So I didn't experience it directly. But what I did experience was this awareness that my body size was something that particularly a lot of the adults around me were aspiring to, which just like take a minute wow. and think like how messed wow. up it is that adults are aspiring to a child's body. Like we are not supposed to have children's bodies. So then fast forward to college, I gained the quote, you know, freshman 15, whatever I gained <laughs> that people talk about. And, you know, now looking back, there's a reason that the the pediatric growth charts continue on to age 21. Like I may have reached my adult height in ninth grade, but I hadn't right. reached my adult body, right? And my adult body was still growing and shifting throughout my teenage years. Mm -hmm. So again, we demonize this weight gain that kids experience in college. It might just be you weren't done growing. You know, this is just like part of you morphing into your adult body. And it's not a shock. The women I'm related to are all, you know, what I would what I call small fat, meaning we're on the lower end of the plus size spectrum. Mm -hmm. It is a surprise to literally no one that I am a small fat adult. Um, the message was this was a failure. You know, I, I experienced mm. it as a failure. And so mm. the reason it's so important to talk to thin kids about these issues is, number one, they're not all going to be thin adults. Bodies right. change. And this is normal and healthy and okay. And what we need to really do is start talking to kids much, much earlier about how normal it is for bodies to change. So this is a given. This is not a failure. This is not anything you did wrong. This is part of growing up, part of growing into your adult self. And even as an adult, your body will continue to change if we're lucky and we all get to still be here, right? <laughs> like that's, right. that's right. aging. And yet all of the messages we have around body changes, think about the messages around postpartum bodies and needing to bounce back. They're all perceived Ooh. as failure, 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 if you don't fight them at every step of the way. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's thing one. Thing two is even thin kids who are going to be thin adults. You know, my husband was a thin kid. He's, a thin, he's just going to be thin his whole life. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. He needs to not be a jerk to fat people, right? <laughs> Like, <laughs> very good point. He needs to know about these issues. Like, we want, you know, just like as a parent of white kids, I think a lot about how do I talk to my kids about racism? Because mm -hmm. when white parents don't do this, we raise racists. I want my thin daughters, even if they don't end up as fat adults, to right. not be anti fat, to be an ally in all of this. You've laid out a complex set of, of problems that a lot of children and families are dealing with right now. But one of the solutions that you pose to wading through all this anti-fatness and anti-fat bias is by having a fat talk or a series of fat talks with children, with other adults in your child's life, like teachers, relatives, grandparents, coaches, and also a fat talk with yourself, mm -hmm. with oneself. What is a fat talk? What is the fat talk? And what are some of your, your tips on, on how to navigate those conversations? 
Well, it's funny because fat talk is actually a term used by body image researchers, and it's a sort Mm -hmm. of inherently stigmatizing term because they use it to describe the way people, and especially women, engage in this automatic, like, I hate my thighs. You hate your thighs are great, but look at my stomach. Like that body shaming, sort of collective body shaming we do. And so what I'm arguing for is a new kind of fat talk. Lots of bodies are fat, and that is the way the world is, and that's great. And if we can start to do that, we can then start to name and navigate all the times when anti-fat bias shows up. So this can be talking about weight at the pediatrician's office. This can Mm. be if your school has a lot of, which a lot of schools do, about half of the states in the country regularly weigh and measure kids and collect their Mm -hmm. BMI. Um, Or if your child's like ninth grade health class has an assignment to track calories for two weeks, which a lot of schools have as a default part of their health curriculum, Mm -hmm. and we're all navigating, um, and (laughs) figuring out how to navigate those moments in a way that keeps your child's bodily safety like first and foremost. Hmm. There's a thought that you share in the book that's basically like you have an opportunity as a caregiver to teach your child that you can be that like line of defense for them, that safe yeah. place for them Exactly. when you have these conversations. Yeah. I mean, like, let's take the pediatrician's office. It's, you know, the common protocol is your child's going to be put on the scale. They're going to calculate their BMI. And a standard part of the well child visit is talking about where they fall on the growth chart and whether that's good or bad and what you need to be doing about it. Mm-hmm. It's not a helpful conversation for kids to hear. It's not to say you never need to know your child's weight. Like you have to put them in a car seat. You have to dose their Tylenol. Like you may right. need that information, but it doesn't need to be a stigmatizing conversation in front of your child. Mm-hmm. And so your first step there is to request that your pediatrician not talk about BMI in front of your child. And you can hand over a post-it note at the start of the visit. You can send an email. You can just ask them directly when it comes up, whatever feels comfortable for you. A lot of doctors are saying to me, I'm so glad when parents say that, you know, this isn't where I want to go with the visit either. I want to do things differently. And so a lot of doctors are going to be super receptive to that. And so even after you've made the request, the doctor may still engage in weight talk in a really stigmatizing way around your child. The number of people I have interviewed about their eating disorders who tell me a moment of origin was the comment their pediatrician made when they were 10 years old, when they grabbed their belly, when they said it's time to switch to skim milk. Like These comments can really land. So it is something to be concerned about. But in all of those interviews, The reason the comment was as problematic as it was is because the caregiver in the room didn't say anything to combat it. So if instead, as the caregiver, we can say something like, you know what, I'm not really worried about that. I trust their body. I know they're growing well. Or thank you, but that's not something we're going to look into at this time. That doesn't feel safe or evidence-based for us. If you can advocate for your child, then no matter what the doctor said, The child cares more about what you think, right? They see the doctor twice a year. They see you every day. So you have an opportunity there to let them know, like, this isn't, this isn't something I'm going to stand for. I will advocate for you. And if necessary, you know, debrief with your kid afterwards. How did that make you feel? Here's what I think is going on with the doctor, you know, but bottom line, we never expect you to shrink yourself. That is not something we're ever going to ask you to do. Virginia, thank you so much for coming on and talking with me today. This blew my mind. Thank you. It was a thrill to be here. Thanks again to Virginia Soul Smith. Her book, Fat Talk, is out now, and you can find her work at the Burnt Toast newsletter and podcast. Hey, Brittany. Hey, Brittany. Hey, Brittany. Hi, this is Meg from Seattle. I just want to know how you all felt about what Jennifer Aniston said about cancel culture. Meg, thank you so much for calling in with this question, but let me back up. For those of you who don't know, Jennifer Aniston did an interview recently with the Wall Street Journal, and she was quoted as saying this, I'm so over cancel culture. I just don't understand what it means. Is there no redemption? I don't know. I don't put everybody in the Harvey Weinstein basket. Now, this was interesting for several reasons. Number one, Jennifer Aniston, quite literally, earlier this month, (laughs) tried to get Jamie Foxx canceled 
over an Instagram post that went completely over her head and she misinterpreted as hate speech. So there's that. I'm like, girl, you were just trying to get somebody canceled this month. But I also think that the way that she went about providing that quote in that interview was kind of interesting. She knew, I think on some level, that mentioning cancel culture and Harvey Weinstein almost in the same breath was going to be a great way to get people talking, which it absolutely did. We all, I think, know on some level that canceling people isn't really a thing anymore at this point. For instance, Louis C.K. recently sold out Madison Square Garden and Chris Brown continues to tour the world and sell millions of records. But talking about cancel culture reliably gets people fired up. And so Jennifer Aniston's comments as someone, you know, who is currently a striking SAG actor who has a new season of her television show premiering next month, I think her comments were really interesting. (laughs) And the timing was really interesting. She knows how to play this game, quote unquote, very, 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 very well. It got me thinking a lot about how we're seeing famous people navigating this time, this sort of like sleepy time in Hollywood where nobody can really talk about what it is that they're working on or heavily promote any of their projects, but still try to continue to get press. So I think that Jennifer Aniston's kind of strange cancel culture Harvey Weinstein quote is unfortunately a sign of things to come. I think we're going to be seeing a lot more attention grabbing moves like this. So those are my thoughts, Meg. Thank you so much for calling in. And to all of you listening, I want to know what you want to talk about too. Anything from the biggest pop culture story of the week to the newest bangers to the TV show everyone is talking about. If there's something everyone in your world is going on about, record a quick voice memo with your first name, location, and the topic and send it to ibam at npr.org. That's I-B-A-M at npr.org. I cannot wait to hear what you want to talk about. This episode of It's Been a Minute was produced by Barton Girdwood, Alexis Williams, Jessica Mendoza, Liam McBain, Corey Antonio Rose. Our editor is Jessica Placek. Engineering support came from Carly Strange, Ko Takasugi Chernobin, Josh Newell. We had fact-checking help from Greta Pittenger. Our executive producer is Verilyn Williams. Our VP of programming is Yolanda Sanguini. Our senior VP of programming is Anya Grundman. All right, that's our show for today. I'm Brittany Luce. See you next week for another episode of It's Been a Minute from NPR.